welcome to Cyberfest 20, the Northeast's biggest cybersecurity festival. My name is Phil Jackman, and I lead on Cyber North, the Northeast Cybersecurity Cluster, developed by Dynamo Northeast and supported by Accenture and the Innovation Super Network. We're working to position the region as a great place to deliver cybersecurity services. Cyberfest, now in its third year, shows the breadth of talent that the industry has in the region and also the wide and often complicated facets that contribute to cybersecurity. So this is the third of 10 events that we have in September. This one's focused on how cybersecurity can affect all of us when we least expect it. We have a change from the original program. I'm grateful to uh, Andrew Tierney for stepping in as Phil. Our scheduled speaker has come down with COVID. Get better soon, Phil. If you'd like to raise questions, please can use the Q&A button and I'll try to get through them as many as you can, but we do have the panel session later on. Those who can't, we'll, we'll look at to, in terms of getting and trying to write back to you. So now I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Joe North, Technology and Transformation Director at the Port of Tyne, who are kindly hosting this event. Hello there, um, a big welcome to Cyberfest and a big welcome from us at the Port of Tyne and also the 2050 Innovation Hub. It really is a pleasure to welcome you to this event and hopefully in the future you'll be able to join us actually in our Innovation Hub um, to, to, to meet and converse and, and exchange ideas and so on. Um, so just a little bit about the Port of Tyne, if you don't know us, we're based in South Shields, which is in the northeast of England, and we are a major port, we are a trust port, which means that we uh, are there not for shareholder return, but actually for our stakeholders and to uh, future-proof the port and as custodians really to hand it on uh, for future generations and continue to, to make the port and the region that we serve more uh, economically prosperous and to look after the environment as well. And as part of that, we have the 2050 Innovation Hub, which you might have heard of. And uh, we're here hosting along with, um, with Phil today for Cyberfest. And you, you are very welcome. The Innovation Hub is a partnership with Nissan, Ubisoft, the Department for Transport, PD Ports, Accenture, Royal Hascone, and Connected Places, Catapult. And our objective is to come together to collaborate to think about how we can actually take our industry forward uh, towards the 2050 maritime vision that the UK government has created. And it's all really about innovation, technology, uh, progression, sharing ideas, and looking at how we can help each other. We have a series of events. So we, we have webinars that are free, workshops, interactive presentations, uh, where you can chat with the speakers. So do have a look at the 2050 Innovation Hub because our autumn season is starting this week and we would love to have you along. So I think that's all from me for now. Have a really great morning this morning. I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're gonna have a great session and um, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. I'll see you later. Just unmute myself. I think in the future we won't say hello anymore. We'll just say you're on mute. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Um, great to be here. And uh, well, even better if we were there, but there you go. Right, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, which is Craig uh, Hayes, who's a security architect at Green Core Group, PLC. We've known each other uh, for several years now, and he's going to talk to us about onshore uh, logistics. Craig, are you there? Good morning. Can you hear me okay now? I can, thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, ready for me to start? Yep, let's do a quick screen share. Is that coming through okay? Perfect. Right, I'll make a start. So today I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity in a logistics operation, in particular our threats, our challenges, and what we can do about them. Uh, to begin with, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So I'm Craig Hayes. I'm a security architect at Green Core Group PLC. Um, I've been there for a few years now. Um, you can find me on all of my links on the right hand side of the screen there and um, it's all pretty much the same but feel free to check me out and see what i write about what i tweet about or you email me get in touch whatever you need um so a bit about my background i started out many years ago working for the mfa the marine fisheries agency which then transitioned to the marine management organization i worked predominantly on an application that was tracking fishing vessels and um, all around the world a lot of distributed 
gets a lot of distributed devices out there. Um, a challenging environment to work in, there's a lot of, like, lot of connectivity problems. Um, after I left there, I moved to a startup based in the Northeast called Insure the Box, which was pretty much the same thing again, but with cars instead of boats. Um, on top of that, we also built an e-commerce platform. We were an insurance provider. And we had a call center based in Gibraltar and in Newcastle as well. So it was the same thing again, but with a bit more complication to it. And then after that was acquired, I left and joined Green Coal Group PLC. Um, so that is a manufacturing company with its own logistics element to it. So again, a lot of the same stuff. We use telematics to track our vehicles, but we also have manufacturing plants. We have a lot of warehouse, uh, warehouses and distribution depots, and we've got a lot of stuff to, to contend with around the UK. So what I'll cover today is the threat landscape for logistics operation, the cybersecurity challenges that we face in logistics, and some practical steps that we can apply to protect our people and technology. Um, so I think first of all, it's worth just addressing what is cybersecurity. And to me, it is about the protection of the confidentiality, integrity and availability of our computer systems and their data. Um, a lot of the press focuses on confidentiality. You'll see a lot about data breaches and all the problems that come with that, whether it be GDPR fines or just embarrassment or the disasters that come with it. The press don't really focus too much on integrity or availability, but for a logistics operation, those are really important things. So I think to start out, I'll talk about our cybersecurity threats and what they are. If you don't understand the threat landscape that you're up against, it's hard to define what your strategy is going to be to defend against them. So I'll start with the who. Um, so I've highlighted here six different categories. The ones that are predominantly going to affect most logistics operations are organized crime. Um, something I like to call unorganized crime, and I'll tell you, I'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that shortly and insiders. Um, the other three nation states probably aren't going to be a problem unless you're part of critical infrastructure. Um, hacktivists, unless you're doing something which is generally frowned upon by the rest of the world, you're not going to get a lot of attention and competitors. There's probably not a great deal to be taken from you. Um, so they'll most likely just leave you where you are. So that's the who. Um, the what. So I've highlighted what those different groups will likely do to you. Starting with organized crime, the big five you'll see are payment fraud, CEO fraud, business email compromise, a denial of service attack, or something that we're starting to call ransomware plus. Unorganized crime is pretty much the same. Um, however, ransomware tends to be less advanced. And I've got a little bit about both of those things later on. When I say unorganized crime, it tends to be individuals working on their own just because they want to make a little bit of cash. They're not really heavily involved in a group. Whereas an organized crime gang might have a team of five or six people doing different roles. Unorganized crime tends to be one person on their own doing stuff. It's hard to, I mean, to stereotype a group, it's essentially bored teenagers who know how to do a lot of stuff with computers, uh, but aren't applying it in the right way. And they're using it to try and make a little bit of side money, generally during school holidays, college breaks, or evenings and weekends. Whereas organized crime is a professional organization that's very much a nine to five, using it to make a living. Um, insiders, you've got accidental data loss is one of the biggest things that can happen. A lot of the breaches we see or where people give out data by mistake, um, they're not trying to do it on purpose, it just happens all of a sudden you've got a GDPR fine on your way because someone made a mistake there. Or cyber enabled fraud where it's they would have committed fraud anyway and now they've got technologies to help them back that up and start to cover their tracks. Um, but I think for me the biggest threat that we face is organised crime. So that's the who and what they're going to do to us. I think it's now we're talking about how they will do those things. Um, so against people, the first thing that we see a lot of is phishing attacks. Now that is ripe across the entire world. All industries are facing that, but phishing is one of the biggest ways to get in. And the reason for that is because it works. It is very effective. Uh, people aren't great at spotting phishing emails and they tend to fall for them a lot of the time. Now, a lot of the terrible ones are pretty obvious, but criminals like they're starting to get really advanced with their own attacks now and they're getting much much better and make them look like real emails from real companies valid user accounts that's where people are using the same passwords on multiple systems so whether it's your own organizations systems and things like facebook or florist's website um, a little online forum for tracking football results, that sort of stuff. Wherever it is, if they're using the same emails and passwords, all it takes is for one website to get compromised and all the rest are at risk. 
and that's something you'll see quite a lot where there's no obvious cause as to why an account's gone missing but all of a sudden you're getting suspicious logins from someone you didn't expect and it tends because they've used the password that's really that's out there they found it somewhere else and um, i guess alternatively they just brute force the password and they manage to guess if it's quite weak if it's password one two three they're probably going to guess it at some point and get in and the third one is social engineering so that one's an interesting one because it doesn't actually require any compromise of any of your systems it's just criminals out there asking you to do stuff and then asking the right way that allows you to fall for it so they'll tend to use a variety of different ways to get you to do it ultimately it's about transferring money or putting you through to somebody else who can transfer money or do something that will bring them some gain attacks against technology public facing applications that's your web apps that are out there your ftp services anything that is public on the internet criminals will go for those because that's a great way to get a foothold you can't always make financial gains from that but it's a foothold in there to allow you to do new things and try and take some money out remote access services that's vpn uh, it's citrix gateways for applications it's anything that you use to give access to people who are working from home now that wasn't such a big deal Maybe this time last year, but at the start of the year when we all shifted from offices to home, that changed massively. We put a lot more emphasis on people working remotely. Uh, you'll see a lot more people using remote access services now and companies have started to open a lot more things up to the world just so people can use them from home. Uh, third is compromised partners. So that is where your supply chain or your customers that you have connectivity with are compromised and that gives them a backdoor into your systems from there. Something we don't often think about, but we protect our own networks and they open up a big door into someone else's to allow us to communicate with them. Uh, but if they get compromised themselves, they've got a big door to come through to you and start snipping around as if they're on your own network. And to me, there's almost a, you've got the surface internet out there and we do a lot of controls around that and who can come in and, and what can they can do. But on the underneath internet, where we all connect to different companies who work together, it's, it's more difficult and a lot of senses is put on that to control what those third parties can do. Uh, but essentially it's a shadow internet beneath the real internet above it's just a lot smaller compromised website is an interesting one if you haven't got a fully patched device and you browse the website which has got some sort of vulnerable software on there and um, they will ex if, if they're being compromised themselves they will download software onto your machine uh, with whatever vulnerabilities are on your browser within adobe reader or whatever it is and then start to run stuff on your own computer from there and removable media is an obvious one. It's been around for a long time. Uh, USB sticks are a great way to pass files around. It originally started out, I guess, with floppy disks. And the first virus did transfer from floppy disk from machine to machine. Now it's USBs, it's smartphones, it's anything you can plug into a computer that isn't always attached. So I've highlighted here the top three from both. Um, and you're most likely to see those three things from each side, which are used by organized crime to do each of those five things. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about each of those. So payment fraud is where criminals are using your payment details to buy things, essentially, whether it's your credit cards or they're taking out loans with your information or whatever it is, they're just using your details to buy stuff in your name. Um, it applies to everyone, not just businesses. We're all potential victims of payment fraud. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that because I think we've all seen it. And it's a threat that we all face, and just the reality we have to accept and deal with. CEO fraud and business email compromise are almost the same thing. With CEO fraud, you'll get an email from someone, a phishing email or a social engineering email, and they'll be asking you to do something. So I've just typed up this example here where someone pretending to be the CEO has asked for some money to be transferred to a bank account by the end of today. If there's a sense of urgency in there, that needs to be done straight away and they pretend to be a person of authority. And um, you'll see that the email address is not the CEO at gmail.com or whatever it is they've used, it just it won't be your company that pretend to be you, but trying to put enough credibility markers in there to make it look like you. Uh, on the other hand, business email compromise, they've actually just obtained access to an account and for all intents and purposes, they are you. Uh, whatever they send, they might be emailing, they might be using Skype or Teams or whatever internal systems you have, they'll message on those and use as many as they can to convince someone to move money to the right place for them. So ransomware is an interesting one and something that terrifies me. Um, in the early days, ransomware was quite dumb, whereas it would hit a machine, encrypt it, and it would just try and spread a little bit from there. There wasn't a lot of intelligence behind it. The encryption algorithms weren't always great, um, but that was just how it started out. It's now evolved to something we're starting to call ransomware plus, 
where it doesn't just hit the first machine that lands on and encrypts it. They'll get a foothold onto a machine, have a poke around, see what they can do. Can they spread to the other machines? Um, can they infect your servers? They'll try and encrypt your backups because that causes more of an incentive to make you pay for the, the, the decryption keys. Uh, they'll cause general chaos within your environment where you don't really know what's going on. Uh, that might be black hole and stuff on the internet. So your bank website might disappear as far as you're concerned because all your DNS is gone. You can't even get to it anymore. Uh, in the background, they'll be trying to save money from your bank accounts. They'll extract your files from you first. So they have a copy of them before they encrypt them. That way they can blackmail you with, if you don't pay us, we will release these to the press and you'll get GDPR fines or whatever else is coming. And after they've done all that, they'll encrypt everything and you can't operate. So that's a bit of a nightmare. And lastly on these five is denial of service. So that's where they will overwhelm your systems with the traffic, whether it's from a few machines or many, many machines, they'll do something that just takes you off the internet and makes it difficult for you to operate. Often with that, you'll get a ransom demand. If you don't pay us X number of pounds, we will keep doing this until you pay and that's your business done until you stop us by paying your ransom. So logistics ransomware victims, there's been a lot so far. I've highlighted five on there. I didn't really want to call anyone out to name and shame. The reality is that we are all susceptible to ransomware and at some point we're probably all going to get hit. And that's what makes it so worrying to me. Um, thankfully for most of us, it hasn't happened yet, but at some point in the future, whether it's one machine or many machines, something will go wrong and we will be a victim of that. I think it's important that we accept that as a fact and, and then work through Stop from happening first of all as much as we can, but be prepared for when it does happen to, to fix the problem. So what makes cybersecurity challenging in logistics? Um, for me, there's a general low cybersecurity awareness within our people in the industry. Uh, if, you, if you think back how it's evolved until very recently, technology wasn't a big part of it, even let alone cybersecurity. And where you have got people who are pretty clued up on IT, the cybersecurity knowledge tends to be quite low. There's a mix of IT and OT, that's information technology and operational technology. Um, and you'll see on the left there, your IT breaks down into your servers, your desktop clients, your laptops, your phones, that sort of thing. The applications that you run, the data that you're working with, whether it's spreadsheets, databases, web documents, email, whatever it is, and then the cloud platforms and systems that allow you to run them. And that's very traditional for IT and everyone's had that for quite a while. OT has been in its own little bubble, the operational technology side of it, where you've got your machines, your industrial controls, your vehicles, your telematic systems, they've all been out there off to the side. Um, and they've never really been interacting with the IT equipment before until recently. So in recent years, we've had a demand to start to merge those together so we can pull data from the operation technology to run analytics against it and to see a bit more detail about how it's performing. It's becoming less of a black box and more of an integrated part of our overall IT network. Uh, and by doing that, it increases the risk. When we converge those two systems together, you've got stuff that's quite mature and well-managed and stuff that isn't so well-managed at all and has pretty much been a black box since day one. And now all of a sudden you're plugging it into your main network and you've got a lot of stuff out there which is vulnerable and difficult to deal with. Um, and on that topic, the equipment in, in operation technology is often quite old. Uh, within IT, we expect three to five years for the life cycle of devices. Within manufacturing logistics, you might be expecting 25 to 30 years for an asset that you buy. Um, and because of that, sometimes updates aren't available for things anymore. They were written many years ago. The, the languages aren't there anymore. There's just people aren't developing those any further. They're often out with support where you bought a support contract for 10 years and it worked and it was great. And then you've kept it running for another 15 years after that. And um, the vendors, you're just not paying them for support anymore. And sometimes the vendors don't even exist anymore. People retire, people have moved on, companies close down because they can't compete anymore. Yet you've still got this old kit out there. All that equipment can have lots of vulnerabilities in there which will cause you problems. And they can be very difficult to fix because there is no fixes for them. Things are often insecure by design. And by that, I mean, they use things that were created many years ago and that was okay back then in their own little black box that was sandboxed away from everything else. Yeah, whether that's just password, this remote execution of things or whatever it is, they the operate in a way that is just insecure by design. Uh, within logistics, we operate in a highly distributed environment. We have equipment all over the UK. Um, not everything's in the same place. In a call center, you can go to pretty much anything you want and then fix a machine, you can take it offline. If you've got a van off somewhere in the middle of nowhere, 
all you can do is ring the driver and, and tell them they've got a problem, but there's not a great deal you can do. What are you going to say to them? Go away from them to come back to the factory to be able to do anything. Um, you also can't really spread your team to every site that you need to be at because there are so many sites. You may have one or two sites with cold coverage, uh, but if you have a problem at another site, it might be an hour and a half, two hours drive to even get it to have a look at what's going on. Logistics is always on. Um, many logistic, logistics businesses are 24 seven businesses. You're operating day and night to get stuff there, especially for next day delivery. We're always on the move, we're always doing things. And because of that, it can be difficult to get downtime to fix anything. Uh, things are disconnected for long periods. So a little bit what I covered before, as well as being far away from each other, things go off the network for a long period of time and you might not see them for hours, days, weeks, or even months sometimes before they come back. The world moves on in that time and new patches will come out there, but all those old devices, they've been gone. They haven't received any of those updates. When they reconnect back to your network again, that's a big hole that's waiting to happen. Sorry about that. And there's limited connectivity while you're mobile. So the, the mobile phone network is generally pretty good in build up areas, but as you're out in more rural areas, uh, signal can be quite bad. And while you might be able to get some basic connectivity there to do just a basic checks to do any sort of detailed analysis or repairs or whatever it is, it's gonna be really difficult on a mobile device. And again, you've got to work for it to come back to the factory to be able to do anything with it. Um, so I mentioned before about availability and integrity. For me, availability is really important in logistics. Uh, if you think about how we used to work, where everything was paper-based and you'd be out in your lorries, your vans, or whatever it was, it was all done by hand and by phones on paper. That's now massively changed. There'll be connected systems. We have people doing voice activated picking. And we have tablets out there with all the information on. You've got robots doing a lot of the picking work for you, which is giving you stuff to put onto a van and drive away. There's a lot of IT servers in there helping manage that all out there and your telematic systems are tracking your vehicles in real time. That is a massive shift from where it was to where it is today, but we've come, become quite, de quite dependent on IT to make that work. Um, if you take that away, it's really hard to go back to the peer-to-peer systems and any impact on availability is gonna cause a big problem for your business. In terms of food, which is what we produce, uh, the shelf life of food is often measured in hours, not days or weeks. If we have a problem getting food out there, it's going to go bad and it's going to end up in the bin. Uh, so any impact on availability will cause us big problems. And integrity is a big thing for us as well. So we're looking for traceability from farm to fork. And that means we've got to track produce from the farm it comes from all the way through the original warehouses to our manufacturing plants, to our distribution depots, and then off to the stores where they go to. Now all that data gets centralized and we have to hold on to that and just in case there are any issues. Um, if something was to compromise that, that will cause us a lot of problems. So for to me, availability and integrity are big parts of what we need to look after. And I guess even within a factory, we have to track what product moves away. So it's not just from van from site to site, it's the allergens in food, it's the temperature of the food and how we store it, it's the machines that operate on it and the cleaning cycles between them. There's a lot of information to track there. And as we move product from end to end within a factory, we've got to track all that as well. So it becomes quite a complex problem. And if that goes wrong anyway, that is just difficult to deal with. So what can we do to protect ourselves from cybersecurity risks in logistics? For me, the first thing we need to do is assess our current state. Unless we know where we are, it's really difficult to decide to do what we're going to do next uh, and for me the way to do that is to use a framework to assess yourself against and a way to measure yourself so i like to use the nist cybersecurity framework it gives you five areas to look upon and so their identity uh, identifying the assets that you have and um, specifying how you're going to protect them specify how you're going to detect problems as they occur what you're going to do when something occurs how you'll respond and then how you recover from it after the fact and I like to use the CMMI model, the Capability Maturity Model Integration. It's a, a framework I won't go into detail, but I like the five different ways of describing your level of maturity there. Um, it's used by a lot of big organizations for how they manage projects. But for me, those are great metrics you apply against how you do each of those things. So within NIST, it breaks down to about 100 or so, maybe 200 questions of, into those five categories and just say, do you do have you got a, an incident response plan have you got backups and do you test your backups regularly and you can rate each of those things against those five levels and to begin with a lot of companies are 
not do much at all. It's very much on the fly. They might have some stuff, but it's not really documented. Then as you start to, to mature that process up a little bit, it'll start to become more managed within your team where it's verbally understood what people are doing. You know you have a backup system that, that does your backups for you, but there's no documentation for someone you to come in and read. And then as you mature that again, you start to get documented processes that a new person come in could pick up and read and process. And then you start to manage that more effectively to the point where you're then optimizing that and trying to run it as efficiently as you can. So in terms of defining where you want to go within those five categories, it's worth stating where you are today and then where you want to be. You don't need to get all the way to a five and be focused optimizing everything. That's not right for every organization. What I found is many organizations start out on the left there with the the five dots where they put a lot of effort into identifying their assets and protecting them, but when they do detection, response and recovery, they don't put as much investment in. The reason for that is I find it's difficult to do those things unless you get unless you get the first two right. If you don't know what you're protecting and how you're doing it, you, you can't really detect any problems with it or respond to any problems that occur. So once you define where you are and define where you want to be, you need to do a gap analysis to figure out what you need to do to get to where you want to be. And that'll help you define your cybersecurity strategy for the next several years. Within that, you need to apply appropriate levels of focus. Um, now at the very start, I showed them all as equal and they are all important, but depending on what your business does, you might want to do different things. And um, if you're working business to business, you probably don't have a lot of personal information. Um, you, your main focus might be on integrity and availability. Whereas if your business to consumer, you might be more focused on protecting your, your customer's information than you are the integrity of your own internal systems. Now they're all important, but you might put more money and more focus and more time towards one thing more than another. That's a decision that we all need to make based on what we do with our own businesses. Um, and that will change over time as our business models change. So we do have to, we have to do them all. They are all important, but I think figure out what is, what, what's the right way to apply to each of these things and spend your time on those in the appropriate way. Uh, we need to build solid foundations. Now I've put a whole bunch of things in the bottom there. It's not a complete list. It's just a few things that came to mind as I was brainstorming. Uh, without solid foundations, things will start to fall apart whenever things start going wrong. If you've got solid foundations in place, things start to get a lot easier. Now a lot of that will be fleshed out as part of your maturity assessment. When you start to see where your gaps are, you'll realize, all right, I might have antivirus, but no one's looking at what's happening with it. There's no one taking care of do we get any alerts to? Are viruses being detected on the network or is it just doing its thing and we're leaving it alone? Uh, back up and restore, you might not be testing it properly. You, if you get everything in there, when you do have a problem, you'll have the tools in place to be able to handle it better. Education is a, is a strange one for, I mean, there's a lot of people out there trying to sell you user education, cybersecurity awareness training. I think for me, there are three different types of education you need to do. Number one is for your cybersecurity team. Um, they have to know what they're doing, they have to be up to date on what the latest threats are, and that's their specialty of cybersecurity. Your IT team needs a general awareness of cybersecurity, but not the level of detail that your specialists do. Um, they have to be aware just to protect the business from all the threats that you're currently facing, but they don't need to be on the cutting edge. And then there's everyone else, and there's a lot of vendors out there trying to sell you stuff for cyber awareness training, whether it's video courses or it's phishing tools or whatever it is. That's where a lot of vendors are spending a lot of the time. Now it's important and we should give them some training, but I don't think it's the end solution. There's only so much training you can give and we don't hire people based on their ability to, to spot phishing emails. We'll hire them to do other things for our business. They're here to service our customers, to make our products, to do whatever it is we do. The detection of, of cybersecurity threats, it's just a thing that they, they should be aware of in the background, but it's not their true focus. They need to be doing their day job while we protect them. That doesn't mean they don't need some education. They don't need to know what a phishing email is. They certainly need that. We have to get a base level in there, um, but it's not the end solution to the problem. I talked a little bit about IT versus OT and the fact that some stuff is just old, outdated, you can't get updates for anymore. With the mature IT space, we can patch pretty much everything. And uh, with the OT space, it's a case of patch what you can and isolate what you can't. If you can't do anything with it, just put it into its own little sandbox network, try to make it as air gapped as you can. There may be some small ways in and out, but just try to make that as small as possible and understand that risk and be aware of what can come in and out there and be very tight on the traffic that goes through and pay attention to what happens at that, that, at that edge where things are communicating in and out. 
we should use tiered layers of protection. And by that, I mean, apply a certain amount of protection to everything. Those are the things we should do as a standard, but then highlight key areas where we can apply a bit more money, a little bit more time, a little bit more focus to protect what's inside there. So that might be your finance systems and data. It could be your HR systems data. It could be your picking systems, it could be your plan systems, who knows? It's all down to what you're doing. But we need to, I think it's, it's wrong to try and apply the same protections everywhere. For some things it's a bit of a waste, not everything's important and the basic protections are okay. But what matters is that we protect the, the key stuff in the appropriate way. We need to invest in response and recovery. Uh, and by that, I mean, if things are gonna go wrong, you will eventually get a ransomware attack on your network. Everything will be compromised. I mean, that's the worst case, but things will be compromised and you're gonna to have to deal with it. To try and say, well, we patched everything, we've done what we can, is, is, is putting your head in the sand. It was going to happen and we need to be ready for it. And we need to test that response capability. Now, as I showed in the maturity model earlier on, a lot of companies don't do that very well. They put more money on the protection than they do on the response but it's gonna happen and we need to respond and we need to respond correctly. So I think it's very worthwhile investing more money in how we respond to threats and how we recover from them. Don't be afraid to outsource, outsource to specialists. Now as a, as a logistics company, that is what we do. We don't specialize in cybersecurity and nor should we. Cybersecurity skills are really difficult to get hold of. Um, just hiring a few people to do basic bits and pieces within an organization is difficult to try and build out a full team capable of 24 seven incident response and to be able to handle that is very, very difficult and it's probably not gonna happen. I have got no problem with outsourcing the right jobs, the right people to allow us to focus on what we do best in the logistics company. So for me, finding partners you can work with who can fill in those gaps where you're weak is an essential thing to do. And on that, I think it's been important to consider cyber insurance. Um, so with most insurance policies, and I've got a background in insurance, you generally don't get any involvement from an insurance company until something goes wrong. With cyber insurance, it's a little bit different. You can get support from them leading up to an event um, before an event even happens. They're invested in making sure it doesn't occur. And if they can put people on the ground with you to either assess where you are from your partner's maturity or do anything to help you bolster your defenses, that reduces their risk and their cost. And the more they can do to prevent you from being attacked, the less they've got to pay out, or they'll pay out nothing at all. In the event that you are attacked and you do have some sort of incident going on, they can literally parachute people into your organization. Now, it won't be their own, it'll be from a third party consultancy. It's someone who specializes in the problem you have, but they'll have them on the ground very quickly. And it's not just technical people, it'll be PR people who can help you manage the fallout to the media, it'll be legal people who can help you manage all of the, the fines that are about to come your way, heaven forbid that's what's going to happen. Uh, it'll be anyone you need to take care of the problem, not just the people who come in and help you technically resolve the problem, whether it's restoring from backups or rebuilding your infrastructure or investigating whatever the problem is. They'll have people on hand who can come in and support you in your time of need. So in summary of what I've covered there, logistics operations have the combined challenges of IT and OT environments. So I mentioned that the IT space is quite mature, the OT space isn't. There's a lot of challenges in there. And as that tries to, as that starts to link more into IT, as we get more connectivity between those and we start to use it more for analysis of what we're doing, it's just opened up a big hole of problems that we've never had to deal with before. And as soon as we connect them in there, we see enormous value, but also enormous threat. The threats that we face in cybersecurity and logistics aren't unique to us, but the way we operate can make them harder. It's the old equipment, it's the operational technology coming into our IT network, it's the stuff being off the network for long periods of time. Um, it's all of it, it's, it just makes it very difficult compared to a traditional IT environment, or like a law firm or a call center or whatever else it could be. Um, availability and integrity are just as important as confidentiality. While the press are really keen to talk about data breaches because it's a nice headline and it gets a lot of clicks, a lot of reads, availability is massive for, for logistics. Um, if your systems go down, you can't ship product, you can't make money. And integrity, if you can't track where things are going, if you can't track where things have been, if you can't see where you need to send things off to, all your plans are gone, I mean, what are you going to do? So for me, they're all as important as each other. Don't focus on just confidentiality. Awareness training won't stop everything, but it certainly helps. Uh, we need to set a base level out there for all our employees. If this is what a phishing email is, this is a threat that you're facing, this is why cyber criminals want your user accounts. This is what they can do with them when they get them. 
I don't expect them to be able to handle everything that comes their way, but the more they can do, the easier it makes my life. Um, they're certainly going to fall for it at some point. It's my job to make sure I've got protections around the outside to help them. Uh, that things like multi-factor authentication, I love that. It just makes life so much easier. If you, even if somebody does give away their password, there's, a, there's an extra step in there that attackers have to go through and generally can't go through to get onto a system. And for, for most cases, that problem goes away. Um, and off the back of that, I guess social engineering, that's another threat where there's, there's limited technical controls you can apply. So the more information you can give to people, the more informed you can make them, the more you can help them understand what the threats are and just make them think before they do something, the, the easier it's going to be to, for them to detect problems and the easier life will be. Um, and then we need to define appropriate controls to protect what truly matters to us. Now, not everything is, is as important as the other stuff that's out there. Like I said, our finance systems can be quite important, whereas our, our company internet, maybe not so much. It's, it's good for informing our people, but if it goes down, might not be particularly bothered. Um, not ideal for the business, but it's, it's certainly not going to stop us from trading in the future. Whereas if we lose all our finance data, all of our personnel data, that's a big problem. And we need to invest in how we test and respond to major incidents. Um, major incidents are going to happen. We need to test our, our responses that we've documented down. Essentially, it comes down to defining our processes that we will do and then regularly drill them as if it's a real thing. Um, if we don't do that and if we can't respond when it does happen, we're going to have serious problems. So that was it for me. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much and I'm, I'm looking forward to any questions you might have. That's great. Uh... Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, some of my formative years were in uh, logistics. Uh, but before I get into that, I presume most of us have, have used some of your products uh, throughout uh, on a daily basis, yeah? Tell us what you share. Yeah. Um, so we make a large part of our business is sandwiches. We're the biggest sandwich manufacturer in the UK. Um, if you buy a sandwich from pretty much anywhere these days, it's probably one of ours. And um, the shelf life, uh, like I said, the shelf life of those is measured in hours. If we can't get it there quickly, any cybersecurity problems that we have are going to make our product go in the bin. So yeah, we do sandwiches, we do prepared meals, we do um, like pickled foods, whether it be like beetroots or pickled onions, that sort of stuff. We do a lot of convenience food, essentially, is our market. Excellent. So uh, no doubt all of us are, are consumers of your, of your products somewhere along the road. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. I was, in, I was involved in, in uh, I was IT director for a company called Spices, which no longer is around, but we used to ship um, office products around. And we used to do everything electronically uh, through EDI. And, um, you know, so we'd have delivery advice notes, which were yeah. logged in before the goods had arrived. And we used to cross dock them and effectively ship them out before they'd even arrived here. It just terrifies me now to think of what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what an attack that would have been. There you go. I think we've got yeah. um, a question. I'm just going to check. Um, Actually, just a comment from the next speaker, Andrew, to say that that was brilliant and, uh, and, and well informative. Oh, thank you very much. I really like that, um, that model that you're, you're suggesting in terms of the maturity model and the way that you're thinking. Is this something you use all the time? It is. Um, I've always used in this framework, bringing in the CMMI ratings is quite a new thing. I was look I've always been looking for a way to measure each of the responses. It's about, it's like a three-tiered questionnaire and at the top you've got those five and beneath that you've got maybe 20 and beneath that there's a load more. As you go through, you can say yes, no, but what does that really tell you? If you can then rate how well you're doing, not just a binary yes or no, it gives you a much better picture as to where you are and where you can improve to. I think bringing in the CMMI ratings made a huge difference to me. Um, I wish I'd known about it earlier than I have, but it's something I've been using very recently and it's very effective. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, Craig, for that. that that's great. And uh, if I could uh, ask you to hang around for the panel, good. And now bring Andrew up. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, I can, Andrew. Look, yeah, uh, okay, thank you very much for stepping in at such short notice. I think it was Wednesday morning that we talked about this, and uh, uh, we were bound to get some COVID problems along the way. So, Andrew, you're part of our team leader at Pen Test Partners, and uh, look forward to hear what you're going to talk about. Great. Okay. Well, um, hopefully you'll be able to see my slides in a second. Let me just get the screen sharing going. Right, so that should be my slides now. Um, 
So, um, as mentioned there, I'm, I'm the hardware lead at Pentest Partners. Um, so I deal with all of the pen testing that is um, non-conventional um, IT. So that ships, it's cars, it's IoT, all those kinds of things. Um, now, I'm going to talk about cruise ships and oil rigs today. Um, they're kind of related to logistics. Now, you have to forgive me. Um, as was mentioned there, I've only had a, a day or so to prepare to get this done. Um, and I'm on holiday as well. So it was a bit of a last minute one. Um, so why am I qualified to talk about this? Well, I used to work on ships. So that's me in the Suez Canal um, in 2006 on uh, one of the very large container ships. So I worked as an engineer on container ships. And that's given me insight into the industry, how it works, the risks that are involved. Um, but I've moved on to more glamorous ships since then, such as cruise ships. And last year we carried out a test on one cruise ship. Now it took one week. There were two people on board, so I was with one of my colleagues. So 14 days worth of testing on the ship. That ship had six engines, four main engines, two generators. So the scale of this thing is huge. We're talking 50 megawatts of power. There was a seven metre swell at some points of this journey. It got very rough for a cruise ship, um, at which point I found out my colleague was in fact incredibly seasick. 500 Wi-Fi access points. Now, when you've got a cruise ship and you want to give Wi-Fi to all of your passengers, cruise ships are made of metal. So you need to have hundreds of Wi-Fi access points to provide that. There were 500 CCTV cameras covering all of the public spaces, the brig, everywhere on board. 1,200 crew and 2,000 or more passengers. So the sheer scale of this thing is it's just absolutely huge. But we also found a pile of vulnerabilities. So what is on a brand new cruise ship? Well, it's not only a ship, it's also a hotel. So you've got all of those normal hotel functions. You've got to clean the rooms. You've got to provide clean water. You've got to provide hot water, air conditioning. It's also a shopping mall. You can buy and sell things. There's swimming pools. There's all these different areas to look at. Now we've made this little diagram showing the attack surface of a ship. So this shows all the different things we need to look at when we get on board of a ship. So you can see why two of us being on board for a week, it's actually an awful lot to cover here. So we've got the typical corporate network, the normal IT on board. But we've also got the OT, that operational technology, and that was mentioned in the previous talk. Now, the gap between IT and OT is becoming more and more blurred. People no longer just want operational technology to be standalone. They want data to flow in and out. They want to be able to monitor things. They want to be able to control things. There's all that on and off board communications as well. All modern cruise ships have something called VSAT, satellite communication that allows you pretty much broadband speed connections on and, on and off the vessel. That allows an attacker remote access to that ship. You've got the physical security as well. What can someone do once they're on board? Where can they walk into? Can they get onto the bridge? Can they go into a swimming pool plant room and gain access to a console that actually lets them control the main engines? You've got all the navigation side of things. Where are chart updates coming from? Um, if someone spread malware onto the radar system how would that impact the vessel so they become really complex really quite fast now this isn't the ship that we tested but it, it, it's kind of the scale the same sort of scale as one that we tested now to keep vessels safe these days they're divided up vertically into things called fire zones now they're also watertight on the lower levels but the idea is is you've got a 60 minute fire barrier between each of those fire zones so you can close fire doors, you can change the ventilation, you can shut watertight doors to segment the vessel and keep it safe. Now that's got an impact on how the network on the ship's architected. So we have those fire zones and within each fire zone, we have something called an RDP, a remote distribution point. And what that is, it's a massive network switch. A, you know, we're talking like a, a, an entire rack of equipment, hundreds of ports on it. And to distribute that network into each one of the cabins, we have what is called a cabin trunk. And that's a big loop of network cable that goes through all of the cabins through a cabin switch. So you've got a network switch for each pair of cabins. Now there'd be lots of them in each fire zone. Now the vessel was actually divided into port and starboard side as well. So that's to provide a degree of redundancy. So all of those RDPs are connected in a big fiber loop. So you've got a big fiber network at the top, wired ethernet going through the cabins. Now, of course, you've got other aspects to this. You're going to have to have servers doing things like the telephones, the TV, the internet access, and you've got that VSAT connection going off board. 
Now, just to give you an idea of the scale of this, this is one half of the patch bay for one RDP. Now, each pair of cables there goes to multiple cabins. We've got, we've got over a thousand cabins on board. So you've got to understand there's so many cables traveling all over the vessel. And that leads to physical exposure. You can't always protect those cables from someone accessing them. Now to drill down into a little bit more depth on what one of those cabin switches does. So we've got that ethernet loop with lots and lots of cabins on it. We've got that cable coming into a cabin switch and it carries what's called a VLAN trunk. That's lots and lots of different networks aggregated together. So they're all stuck down one network cable and then a switch can split them out into other networks. So what other networks do you actually need? Well, we've got our cabin, so we've got our TV. So all the TV is done over IP. So that's one of the networks that's carried there. We've got our VoIP phone as well. That's carried over a different network. We've got something called the cabin control system. Now what the cabin control system does is it lets you control the lighting, the HVAC and the access control, the door on the cabin, as well as the temperature of the water that's provided to the cabin. So this allows them to save energy on the vessel. It means they can turn the HVAC down um, or off when there's no one in the cabin, they can control the lights, the power, things like this to save energy. Now each cabin switch split was uh, divided between two cabins. So we had cabin A, cabin B, pretty much mirrors of each other. But every now and then we also had a couple of other things hanging off that cabin switch. So we had Wi-Fi access points. Remember I said there are about 500 of those. So a proportion of cabin switches had Wi-Fi access points connected to them. But you also had those CCTV cameras. Where it was easiest, they would connect a CCTV camera into one of the cabin switches. So we've got a lot of different networks going through this cabin switch. Now again, I'm going to come back to this idea of a threat model. What, who's actually going to attack you? What are they going to try to achieve? Again, mentioned in the previous talk, the CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity and availability. Now, confidentiality is the one that everybody thinks of. Integrity, maybe people don't really consider that too often as well, but availability, just being able to provide a service, is the one that people quite often completely ignore. So when we were looking at attacking a cruise ship, we worked with our customer to develop a threat model to work out what the actual risks were here. Now, from their perspective, we could take control of the vessel, possibly. You know, remotely, we could steer the vessel, something like that. Now that wasn't, although it's a big concern of theirs, the motivation to control a vessel remotely, well, it, it requires um, someone to be maybe, um, uh, have a screw loose, to be honest, you know, to someone take a control of a cruise ship with thousands of passengers on and cause impact, someone really needs to want to do that. Have a loss of services, just stopping people being able to pay for things in the restaurants, stopping the ship being able to leave ports, they have to pay port fees. It causes loss of services to the passengers, costs the cruise company money. So that was what we were looking for here. Could we cause loss of services? Now, the first issue we found, just another hole in the wall. You're going to have to forgive the awful puns on these. Every ship has something called a load computer. And what a load computer does is it takes the loads on the vessel. So that's the levels in the tanks, the numbers of passengers you've got on board, the stores you've got on board and it calculates the stress on the hull. It calculates if the, the ship is stable or not. And then it provides advice to you to ensure that the ship does remain stable. It's very, very important. There's been a number of incidents in the past where ships have either been incorrectly ballast or loaded incorrectly and they've capsized or the hull's become so stressed that it, it's come under fatigue. There's been holes and cracks have formed. So the load computer is critical. A modern ship is so complex that you cannot carry out these calculations on paper. Now, as I said, it takes all of the levels of the tanks and uses them in the calculations. And rather than type them in manually, what it does is it takes them from systems on the vessel through network connections. Now, every ship, every modern ship of any size now has something called an integrated control and monitoring system, ICMS. A lot of people call it automation. So this is all the screens on the bridge or the screens in the engine room that allow you to view the plant, to view what's on the vessel and control it. Sometimes it allows complete control, steering, propulsion. Other times it's just the machinery, but it allows a high level of control over various systems. And people have become highly reliant on the information that it provides to you. 
So air gaps are mentioned as well. Now in an ideal world, the ICMS, the control side, the OT side is completely air gapped away from everything else. So we've got the bridge ICMS and the engine room ICMS connected together, but ideally air gapped from that high risk customer facing network on the vessel. Now there's a common thing used in OT networks, which are called IP to serial converters. And what they do is they take ethernet, a normal network connection in on one side, and on the other side, they just communicate with serial. That's a much lower level protocol. It's quite often used to interact directly with plant. Now you have tens of these on a ship. These, this is one particular brand, the Moxa Nport. Um, anybody who's worked in maritime will recognize these. Um, on the other side of it, the opposite side ethernet, on this side, a, a DB9 connector with RST32. Now this was how this ship was reading the tank levels. There's a serial network that connects all of those tanks. Readings come from the tanks, get put out into that network and the ICMS read them. Now we had that load computer. Now that also had its own IP to serial converter that was connected to that same network. So there's two IP to serial converters in that same serial network. That then sent the readings through to the load computer so it knew what the levels were in the tank. Now to actually work out and view and interact with this server, they needed a console on the bridge, a computer on the bridge to use the load computer. So that load computer server was buried in a machine room somewhere. We didn't actually physically find it. There wasn't any need to demonstrate this risk. Now they had to establish a network connection between those two. But they were several decks apart and you can't just go drilling holes in decks in ships. You've got to go through dedicated cable penetrations. You've got to fire seal them. Change requests have got to be filled. So people become lazy on ships when they want to run long distance network connections. Now what they found, the third party who installed the load computer, was that they could actually pick any two ports on the wall, just normal Ethernet wall ports and plug into them with the load computer UI and server, plug them into the wall ports and a network connection was established between the two of them. So probably what happened when it was being installed, they realized they didn't have a cable run between the two of them. So they found that if they just plugged in anywhere, they got a connection. All's well, it's working, isn't it? So they've got a working system. The problem was, was that unassigned wall ports on this ship needed something called an 8021X certificate. 8021X is a, a way that your computer can provide or device can provide a certificate to a network and say, hi, I'm a corporate laptop, hi, I'm a piece of OT equipment. And then you'll get put into the right network, the right VLAN. So you're segregated and can communicate securely. The problem here was if you didn't have one, you get put in something called a tar pit. Now it turned out that everybody within that tar pit could communicate together. Now this introduced a fairly serious issue here. We found that we could go and sit in the bar, for example, find a wall port on, on just down on the side, of one of the walls, plug into it, and we actually had access to the load computers. The problem is load computers have a default username and password. Now this default username and password is so common that every single deck officer across the cruise industry will know this username and password. So we could log in to that load computer server. So we've got complete control of it. It runs as administrator, so we've got full rights. We could then compromise that IP to serial converter. Now we've got those ballast tank levels, fuel tank levels, and so on. We've now got the ability to not only listen to those levels, but inject messages onto that serial line. So that's one of the risks with serial. You can't tell if someone's spoofing messages. You can't tell if someone's sending messages when they're actually meant to be receiving them. So we injected messages onto that serial line, and as a result, the ICMS, that system that people rely on to understand the levels in those tanks, was started showing hundreds of errors because it was getting conflicting readings for ballast tanks. One minute they were full, next minute they were empty. It was causing real cognitive load to the people on the bridge who were supposed to be monitoring things. So that load computer system needed the network and the third party found that wall ports just connected together. So they just used them. So that meant that the load computer was accessible from any wall port and that shared password on that load computer allowed us to access it, to pivot to that IP to serial converter, inject those tank readings, spam the ICMS and cause a denial of service essentially. <clears throat> so again, this is coming back to that idea of availability. 
and integrity. It's not always the confidentiality that matters here. It's also this idea of defense in depth. If that load computer didn't have a shared password, we wouldn't have been able to have com compromised it trivially. If you carry out multiple steps to protect your, your uh, assets in your network, it doesn't matter if one of those fails because other controls will step in. Time and tide wait for no VLAN. Yeah, okay, these are really bad. Um, coming back to this cabin switch arrangement, um, you can see we're carrying lots and lots of networks over that black trunk connection through all the cabin switches, TV, VoIP, cabin control, Wi-Fi, and CCTV. Now what we found, now bear in mind the ship we were testing was in service. So there were passengers on board and we couldn't really make it known what we were doing. So we wanted to conceal that we were trying to hack the ship. What we actually found was gaining access to this network trunk was of extremely high value to us. It lets us attack other networks. So what we did was we unplugged the TV and the VoIP phone from our cabin. So now we've got two dangling network connections inside our cabin. We then took the cabin switch out of the network. So our cabin switch, we just bypassed it. So we connected our TV and our VoIP phone onto those network connections. We then put our own switch in the cabin into that trunk. And from that perspective, it allowed us access to all those different VLANs, all those different networks carried on that trunk port. So now we've got the ability to attack everything we want. We could attack the TV, we could attack the VoIP, we could attack the Wi-Fi and we could attack the CCTV. Now we used this to great effect. We'd managed to log into all of the TVs. We could change the default background that was showing on the TVs when you arrived in the cabin. This could cause severe reputational harm to a, uh, to a cruise company. We could disable all of the phones, which again causes passenger inconvenience. We could also access all of the CCTV cameras. So that allowed us just to go through every single CCTV camera and grab a clip of them. Again, it's a privacy impact here. None of them are in private areas of the ship. But again, if, if an attacker can say, look what I've done, I've viewed all the CCTV on your ship, it looks very bad. Again, coming back to this cabin control system, this was actually architected quite strangely. Every individual cabin had a cabin control board connected to the lighting, water, door and HVAC. Now, most systems like this with lots and lots of small devices around connect back into a server. So the device will connect back to a server. That's how most IoT around us works today. But this was following more of an OT pattern where the control server was actually connecting back out to the cabin control devices. So every cabin controller was listening for messages from that cabin control server. So with that, we were on those trunks. We could actually control all of those cabin controls. So we could turn people's heating up and down. We could turn their power on and off. We could lock them out of their rooms. The other thing that would have been possible, but unfortunately we weren't permitted to do, would be to write on the side of the ship. So you could write something using the cabin lights on the side of the ship using the system. Now some ships use this regularly um, to do things like this. But again, reputational harm could be caused. One other thing that cannot be ignored is the concept of physical access. Now, when you've got a cruise ship, you've got thousands of people on board. And those thousands of people have got physical access to your networks and your hardware. Now, nearly all switches have something called a serial console port on it. So I can connect my laptop with the serial cable and interact with it. Now, Cisco switches, very, very common, have something called password recovery mode. And the idea there is you can reboot the switch and reset the password of the device so you can get back into it if you lock yourself out. But it also lets us dump the configuration of that switch. We can extract the configuration and that includes password hashes or encrypted passwords. Now in this, this instance, what it gave us was a password hash and we found the corresponding password for that. With that password, we actually found from our perspective, again, from that single compromised trunk in the cabin, we found that one, just one single one of the, those remote distribution points hadn't been properly isolated and had been left with that password and an interface to log in to it with that password. That allowed us to compromise one of the RDPs, which carries all of this traffic. So it's not just the traffic for one trunk, it's the traffic going all over the vessel. So that allowed us to intercept everything. 
So these VLAN trunks run all over the ship and you can connect from inside the cabin using the TV and the phone connections and you get access to all these different systems and it allows sniffing to get plain text authorization. And so you, you can find that password by brute force from that hash. You can use it on part of the core network and then you get inception of all of them. Issue three, I'm the captain now. Now this thing is a tablet, a rugged tablet, and these were used for taking orders um, in all the restaurants. They were also used for mustering. So if the ship has to be evacuated, um, they take a roll call on these things. And this is called a passenger management system, PMS. It did a lot of different things. Now, all of those tablets connected via Wi-Fi, so people could walk about and take orders in the bars and restaurants. And they used that 8021X, that thing that stops you just being able to connect to a network. So we couldn't just connect to the Wi-Fi network and attack the servers. However, what we actually found was that although they were using the Wi-Fi on 8021X, they were using HTTP, not HTTPS with the encryption, TLS like we're used to when communicating with our bank or something like that. They were just using plain text communications. Now we've got the ability to intercept all traffic on this vessel from the previous issue. So we managed to sniff that traffic and we managed to find a shared username and password. So we managed to find the server and the username and password that was used to log into it. With that, we managed to compromise that server. What that let me do was gain complete control of the passenger management system. So I could book any table in the restaurant that I wanted to. Um, I could also become the captain and order the most expensive bottle of wine and get it billed to his account. So again, this was a serious failing. I, I might have become the captain within the context of the passenger management system. It's, it's not crucial to safety, but again, reputational harm and disruption. So the PMS had good Wi-Fi security, but it used HTTP for communications. So we recovered those common credentials and we could become anyone. So again, it's this idea of defense in depth. Although that Wi-Fi security is good, once that control had failed, once we were able to sniff that traffic, we managed to gain something that gave us access to another system. Now I'm gonna move on to the oil rig. Remote hands make light work. This test was done a couple of years ago now. Um, this is a, a similar rig to the one that we are working on. So it's called a semi-submersible platform. Um, it uses something called dynamic positioning. So it doesn't anchor itself to the seabed. What it does is it has massive thrusters on the bottom of it. Now this one's got eight huge thrusters. They're electrically powered by generators. And what it uses, it uses GPS and, and uh, gyros and lots and lots of different inputs to maintain position using those thrusters. It's really important it doesn't move off position. If the drill moves more than a certain amount side to side, it's going to have problems. It's going to snap or they have to, they have to shear it off to stop issues happening. Now, an oil rig has a bridge. This looks very, very similar to the bridge on practically all, uh, all modern vessels. Um, it's that ICMS system I talked about before. It's also got generators. Now this one had eight generators and there's two pairs, one big, one small. The scale of this thing again is really quite large. But it also had something called the drilling control network, the DCN. That was kind of segregated away from the propulsion. Now these are the drillers chairs. Um, so these are called cyber chairs. These are where the drillers sit and those joysticks allow them to control the drill to add, uh, uh, to move it up and down, to do lots and lots of things there. Underneath there was a, a equipment room. Now equipment room contained lots and lots of control gear. Now everything out on the actual platform had to be gas tight to a certain extent. Um, if gas leaks out, they need to make sure that it doesn't get into equipment rooms, anything that can create a spark and therefore create an explosion. Now to go out to that equipment room, therefore you need to get fully kitted up in PPE. So we're talking hard hat, goggles, ear defenders, boiler suit, safety boots, radio. You have to put your laptop in a case. Going out there is a real pain. And it's a, probably a 10 minute walk as well, up and down a lot of different stairs. So we've got these different systems on the rig. We've got the propulsion, the drilling, the blowout preventer, the thing that shears that drill chain, the corporate network, the normal stuff. We've got third party people on board as well. As well. And then we've got the core network, that, like the RDPs on the cruise ship, gluing everything together. Again, this concept of an air gap, 
Now we did actually find on here propulsion was completely air gapped. There was no way to remotely access it. But again, it had satellite communication and it had remote access to that drilling control network. But we found that was pretty secure. Now we went out to that little equipment room and we were having a potter about in there and we found this computer. So it's just a, a normal desktop PC in that room. And we asked it what network connections it had. And we noticed it had lots of network connections. It had one onto that drilling control network, that's XLAN B, but it also had one onto the main local area network. It said the media was disconnected, so it suggested that, that it wasn't actually connected to that network, but it said that there was a DNS suffix, court.local, which very much suggests it's been connected to the corporate network in the past. It didn't take long for us to turn to the left and notice that there was a network connection unplugged from the wall. Now what we did was we plugged that into the nearest port. It's pretty obvious that that cable has been plugged in in the past. And of course that machine then got an IP address and was able to communicate on the corporate network. So now we've got what we call a bridge between the IT and the OT domains. So we've got that corporate network through to the drilling control network. Now, we strongly suspect that this was put in place by someone on the vessel so they didn't have to go through that rigmarole of getting kitted up to go out to that equipment room. Now, that kind of makes sense, but it got worse. When we looked at it, we found that TeamViewer, the remote access software, was in fact on that machine as well. That meant that from the internet, we could connect to the drilling control network. So now we've got the situation that anyone on the internet with just a password can connect to the OT networks on an oil rig. Due to another series of vulnerabilities, we could have caused severe disruption to drilling operations by bricking lots of equipment. So what conclusions can you take from this? Well, availability can trump other risks. I think both my talk and the talk previous have said that availability, it's not just confidentiality, what happens if your systems stop working? Reputational harm cannot be ignored. Now again, it's the idea of putting bad things up on the TV screen, writing rude words down the side of a ship, causing all of the payment systems to fail. Little things like that cause reputational harm and it's hard to claw that back. OT needs to be handled differently. Um, it's hard to patch. Lots of companies don't maintain their systems. They don't provide firmware updates. But this idea of connectivity to OT systems is becoming more and more common. Air gaps are becoming rare. That on the rig finding the propulsion system is completely air gapped is very uncommon. I don't think any modern um, uh, ship we've been on has actually had an air gapped propulsion network. There's always been a way, some kind of path through to it. It may be well secured, but there is that path. Watch third parties carefully. Now, you're always going to get contractors involved. You're going to get people developing systems for you. But are they doing things actually securely? Have you asked them to do things securely? A lot of the time when it comes down to it, when we actually find these issues in third party systems, we look at the contract and there's nothing there saying you need to change your passwords from the defaults. You need to provide a minimum level of security. That's not there. So watch third parties and what they're doing. Keep them in control. Apply defence in depth. Most of those issues I've just illustrated could have been prevented if someone else had put other security controls in place. If the outbound firewall on that oil rig had detected TeamViewer connections, someone would have been able to detected that use of TeamViewer and said, no, we shouldn't be doing this. Remove that from that computer. If, um, if the password for the cabin switch had been stronger so we wouldn't, hadn't been able to brute force it, we wouldn't have been able to have gained access to that RDP and sniffed all of the traffic. I'm a massive subscriber of this predict, prevent, detect, respond um, and recover sometimes gets put in there. I prefer the four step one, that's just me. But this idea of working out what your threats are, preventing them, detecting them and responding is so important. It provides that multi-layer defense in depth it lets you actually respond to events and is absolutely crucial in all information security. So thanks for listening. Um, I'm Cyber Gibbons. Uh, I work for Pentest Partners um, and I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you learned something from it. Thank you. All right, I'm back. So first of all, it's such a thank you, Andrew. Wow, where do we start? 
Uh, I don't think I'm ever going to go on a cruise ship again. To, <laughs> such as that. So and clearly you've got a, a, a distinct technical uh, background. Do you really need to think that um, si the C-suite people, senior management, need to think like a hacker thinks in the designing systems? I don't think they need to think like a hacker thinks. Um, I think... I think there needs to be a balance found here. I think the information security industry has traditionally been really bad at communicating risk up to people who are less technical. Um, at the same time, I think uh, people do need to have a basic understanding of some of the concepts involved here. Um, it, it, it's very difficult sometimes. It takes a lot of time to, for me to communicate issues like that to people who really are not technical. Um, you do end up in that situation often where people think it's like a boy who cried wolf situation. Um, it, it, some of these issues do require a lot of skill to exploit. Um, and it's not always possible for people to understand that when they don't have technical understanding. <clears throat> okay, so it, um, it seems like a lot of the things that have been done or put into, you know, which can uh, create vulnerabilities with it, ships and the armaments are done by convenience and or, or to make it easier to do something. Yeah. Do you think convenience is, is a big threat in terms of security? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've got hundreds of vulnerabilities from ships and most of the most serious ones have resulted from someone making a change where they didn't understand the consequences of that change. Um, and often that's driven by convenience or a lack of time. Um, sometimes you just need to get things working in a maritime environment. Um, availability sometimes has to trump security or confidentiality. Um, it does. We've, I think that this is the thing we need to recognise that ships are challenging working environments and we need to provide the tools for people to work effectively. If we don't make if we make things so inconvenient, they just bypass them. I mean, a big example, uh, a ship I was on recently, um, you had to use a password to log in to all of the uh, I ICMS terminals. Now, because you have to do that tens of times a day, and they've got awful membrane keyboards, you know, there's keyboards you can barely type on, like a ZX Spectrum. Um, <clears throat> all the passwords were a simple numeric sequence. So that security control, it was well-meaning, but it just gets bypassed because people, people can't work with it. And I think we need to recognise that. The, the other one is people put passwords on monitors on ships all of the time because systems need to be available in the blink of an eye. That load computer, if there's a disaster situation, an emergency situation, you can't be hunting around for a password or calling someone up and saying, I forgot the password for the load computer. So we need to recognise that it's different to conventional IT, really. Okay, great. Get them get that balance right. But, okay, yeah. just, thanks very much once again. If you just hang around for the panel, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. Certainly. Thank you. Excellent. Right, uh, if I could ask Ian and uh, James to come up. Ian, who's the head of uh, information technology at the Port of Time, we're going to start the panel discussion but with uh, James Holmes, Chief Information Officer at the North of England PNI Association. Good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies, I'm a bit dark here. I'll try and sort that out in a second. Um, thanks for inviting, uh, inviting me to two fantastic uh, presentations from. Andrew and Craig. Um, I think I'll be speaking to Andrew next, before I next go on a cruise ship to see if I can get some free Wi-Fi. <laughs> so uh, I'd also like to introduce James Holmes, who's the C uh, CIO of North Group. Um, James, if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute to introduce yourself, your role, and uh, North Group. That would be fantastic. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. And uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, my name is James Holmes. I'm the CIO uh, at uh, North uh, North is a uh, northeast-based uh, mutual P&I uh, insurance company with a global presence. We have offices uh, all over the world: Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Greece, China, New York, uh, to name but a few. Um, and what does uh, North do? Essentially, we provide um, three services. We provide protection and indemnity insurance uh, for the maritime industry uh, to essentially. To easily understand that, that's essentially third party insurance, oil tankers, cargo ships, uh, etc. We also offer a service called Freight Demurrage and Defense or FDD for short. And the easiest way to describe that is when people are buying car insurance and you have that little tick box to say that you want legal cover on it, 
Um, that's essentially uh, what that service provides. And then finally, we also provide a loss prevention service, which is an advisory service to advise our, our, our members uh, on how to help mitigate risk and therefore keep insurance claims to a minimum. Uh, we are based down on the Quayside uh, in Newcastle. Uh, we have about 350 staff uh, globally, uh, and that's what the IT department uh, supports. Um, and currently we are working on a business change program and also have been, uh, for the last couple of years, been upgrading a number of key uh, business systems. So hopefully that's a, a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what North uh, do. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, James. That's uh, really interesting. Um, so just getting into the questions, um, obviously there's increased pressure from customers and consumers for more and more real-time information. Now that in theory we can track anything anywhere, how much of a concern is cybersecurity? Well, I, I think that, that, I mean, Craig really highlighted some of the challenges that we have, and okay, that's within the cruise ship industry, but actually if we look at it, we have the same problems or the same challenges across uh, all of the uh, maritime industry. You know. We have over 90% of the goods arriving, uh, uh, arriving in the UK come via um, ship, and that, that is a challenge. We can see uh, you know, further technology, uh, and I think, Craig, you, you touched on it earlier, the joining and the getting closer of OT uh, and IT. I think some of the challenges that we have seen uh, from North is we, we have not seen uh, in the public domain any records of any ships being directly attacked. Um, now, Craig, you might have different information to that, but we believe we haven't seen it. I think it's only a matter of time uh, before that happens. What we do see, as with all under, uh, other industries, if we look across, is the attacking and the challenges that we have for uh, land-based. You know, we've just got to talk about Maersk, uh, and I think uh, Craig touched on that again in, 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 the, in the first uh, thing. And then Andrew's talked about some of the challenges around... Um, uh, what happens on cruise ships, uh, et cetera, as well. So uh, quite a lot going on. I think one of the things that we have and see quite a lot of is uh, man in the middle attempts. As you can imagine, within the shipping industry, there is a, a lot of uh, high value transactions going on as goods moving around the world. Uh, and, and we do hear a number of reports uh, from our, our members uh, around some of those kind of um, challenges. I think as part of that, North also has done some significant modeling around cyber breaching within large shipping companies so that they can understand the financial risk and exposure they potentially have. Okay, so um, all three of you have mentioned uh, the OT aspect of um, the industry. Uh, obviously, with the dawn of Industry 4.0 and Internet of Things, we're connecting pretty much everything to everything. Um, this is fantastic from an industry advancement point of view, but obviously there's risks associated with that. What are your thoughts on um, areas around Internet of Things and global connectivity? Yeah, so, so I think, again, I, I think really Andrew was very clear on some of the challenges that they have there. And we, we are seeing this, you know, OT and IT, and Andrew touched on this earlier, joining closer to closer together. I think Andrew also mentioned about VSTAT, so that's the connection speed to, the, to, to vessels. They're at broadband level now, so it's making it easier and easier and, and creating uh, that opportunity there. I think one of the things that we have seen and we hear a lot of actually within the shipping industry is the uh, deliberate manipulation of um, GPS signals, for example. So where vessels are tracking and they're uh, trying to work out or, or they're tracking to where they are, we are seeing, and there's a number of, publicly available uh, records around that, around GPS uh, manipulation by um, state actors. So that is something uh, really that we have seen quite a lot of uh, and continue to see that uh, in the future. I think one of the things that, again, I think Andrew touched on and, and so, did, so did Craig is one of the first things I believe that we need to do is we need to make sure that individuals carry out a security assessment. Now, Andrew touched on it and, and obviously went one stage further and went into quite a lot of detail on some of the assessments uh, that he's been doing from, a, from an asset process risk and security control point of view. But actually, one of the first things that we have been, one of the things that we've been doing and working with our members on is actually just educating them on how important cybersecurity is. So we, we've been working with a third party to be able to provide that service to our members to help them start to go on that uh, cybersecurity journey and educate 
uh, the wider business. Excellent. So obviously we're concentrating on the maritime sector today um, and we've all seen images in the, the news over the past few years about Somali pirates boarding ships um, uh, and, and pirating and, and threats from that aspect. Do you think we're now seeing a shift away from physical piracy to online piracy? Um, so, so yes, again, I'm not aware of a direct cyber attack, um, but what I, I do suspect and believe is that these pirates are using digital methods. So they will be hacking into uh, AIS data to be able to track vessels uh, and be able to see where they are. So making it easier for them to physically then go along uh, and uh, potentially uh, take control of them, as we've seen in the press, I think, on a number of times. I think the classic that, that um, Craig talked about earlier was Maersk. And, uh, and I know you didn't single that out, but I know Maersk very much went on the front foot when they had their attack back in June 20, 2017 and were very open about the challenge they have and, were very, and, and, and have on a number of occasions, the CTO, the CSO, uh, et cetera, have talked about the challenges they have. But for those that don't know, they ended up uh, having a ransomware attack. There was, I think it was 14, 49,000 laptops, 3,500 servers globally that were impacted by um, this. Um, and, and just the sheer scale, they, have, they were responsible for 76 ports and over 800 vessels worldwide. And of those 800 vessels, that's approximately a fifth of the world's shipping capacity was suddenly rend rendered useless because we didn't have the IT systems to control and understand it. So there was some significant impact there. Um, do, we, do we see this uh, becoming more of a problem in the future? I think what we need to do is we need to see what happens. I think, again, touching on it earlier, IT and OT are, are getting closer together. Um, I think the current ships, whilst they are digitally enabled, I, I still believe, uh, and I know Andrew is much closer to this, and he touched on it earlier, there is still air gaps in some of the, on those key systems. So at the moment, I don't believe that we could be fully taking over uh, vessels remotely. But again, Andrew, you might be a little bit closer to that to, to advise on. But I suppose the one final thing is, is the uh, IMO, so the International Maritime Organization, are working uh, with the industry to introduce new uh, regulations and guidelines from uh, January 2021. So this, this is being taken seriously within the industry. Um, I, I don't know if it's okay for me to just step in and, and mention a couple of things there. Yeah, um, so one of, one of the interesting things there, we, we talked about piracy. Um, so I think that there's also, now that containerized shipping's almost the norm, um, there's also a risk that uh, things are stolen uh, even once they're on land. So it's not traditional piracy. There was a really interesting case in 2012 at the port of Antwerp where two containers of cobalt, I think, um, were stolen by an actually really quite advanced attack. They put an implant on the network. There's something called ERS, the electronic release system, where drivers, you know, type in a pin, get given the container, and they bypassed all of this to steal huge value using a cyber attack, essentially. Uh, it's a lot lower risk than boarding a vessel, and you can also steal something that weighs tons. It's not easy to do that from a moving container ship. Um, yeah, the other thing in, in terms of remote control of a vessel, we've managed it twice. Um, once full control, uh, the other time enough to permanently black out the ship, but this was an extremely targeted attack. It took us days of effort on board the vessel with a deep understanding of how the systems work. It, it's, it's, not, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely today. Okay, so I'm gonna fairly tenuously link from um, taking over a vessel remotely to autonomous vehicles and vessels. Um, obviously hearing a lot in the news, um, probably more so about land vehicles, but um, waterborne vessels are becoming more prominent, a lot more testing. Um, how far away, James, do you think we are from pilotless shipping? So actually it's already here. Um, there, are, there was a first commercial crossing, it uh, was in June last year, that took place between uh, the UK and Belgium and that had a, just had a case of oysters on board, but that was our, the first commercial uh, crossing with a unmanned uh, vessel. There's other examples of that. We've got examples of a uh, car ferry in late 2018, uh, sailed and docked itself. Yes, I, there was crew still on the bridge ready to take control, but that, that, those steps are obviously happening. Uh, we've, got, we've got numerous examples of the Navy already using unmanned vessels. I suppose the one thing is at the moment is these tend to be in much more of a uh, 
smaller uh, vessels and therefore the, the larger vessels aren't coming on site. I think it's only a matter of time um, before we start to see uh, this going further into some of the larger vessels. And again, I know the IMO, the International Maritime uh, Organization, are carrying out further exercises to try and fast track some of the legislation around uh, autonomous vehicles or autonomous vessels uh, to, to make sure that there's some acceptable international standards and safety is adhered to. So there, uh, yeah. Excellent, some decent advances in that area for the sector. So yeah. um, Craig and Andrew in the conversation now. Um, I'd like to hear your, your opinions on how seriously do you think logistics companies are taking the threat of cybersecurity? So James, you first. Uh, yeah, um, I think we just need to step back. I think everybody needs to take it seriously. I think it was touched on before, there is some low awareness. Um, I think we need to continue to educate uh, both at all levels within the business, not just at the board level, but uh, right the way across. I think one of the interesting things is, and I think we all know, and again, I think it was touched on in both presentations, especially within Craig, is logistics are becoming more complex. So actually, as they become more complex, technology is playing more and more an important role and becomes very dependent. I think, Craig, you touched on uh, the, the, the challenges of actually, if you lost IT systems, how would, how would your business function? Uh, and again, I used to work for Greg's and again, the technology that's there to support Greg's and the logistics arms of that, um, not having that in place would make significant challenges to the business. Craig, anything to add? Um, I think, oh sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So thank you. I think the, the, the way businesses are treating it varies depending on the business out there. I think it's quite a broad spectrum. Some are taking it very seriously and will bring in dedicated teams to do cybersecurity where others do it as a byproduct of what they need to do to make it work. I think it varies. It's quite a strong gradient from one end to the other. Um, I, th I think it needs to be more important for the ones that don't treat it as importantly, but I think it varies from place to place. So if you look at last mile logistics, man in a van, I mean, they do pretty much nothing. There's a lot of franchises, there's a lot of small operations there, and they do nothing. I would imagine almost nothing around the service security. Now they'll rely on the bigger partners who get them into that supply chain to do the work for them, but themselves, they do nothing at all. Um, they use email to communicate, they'll be fished, they'll do all sorts of things there that they didn't even know about, um, and they've got no awareness of what's going on. The other side is the big logistics companies, whether it be shipping or on land or whatever it is, um, they're probably investing a lot more in it. There's some who don't and should, but overall, that is, is probably a stronger place in terms of the amount of effort they put in. But if you think of the ratio of, of number of companies, the big companies are the minority, and then you've got a lot of small last mile logistics firms out there. So it's quite a, a weighted balance where there's a lot of people doing not a lot, in my opinion. Andrew? Um, I think Craig pretty much said what I was going to say there. What we find, it, it, it's the kind of middle ground and the, the last mile, the smaller companies are doing not enough it's the the bigger companies that it's their reputation at stake should supply chains fail really uh, the common use of just in time means that all it takes is for you know a, a lorry load of bread to fail to get to a factory one day and that's production stopped um, at the same time when you kind of go further up the chain we're seeing there's a lot of technology being introduced uh, iot things like container tracking uh, refrigeration trackers all these kinds of things and the security of these systems is more akin to old school OT than it is IOT. They're not really thinking properly about security yet. Okay, Craig, uh, just to pick up on a point that you mentioned in your presentation, being cyber insurance, um, what would you say to companies that haven't considered cyber insurance or, or don't have it? I think it's worth looking at what value you can bring to you, even if you never cash it in. So as I mentioned in my talk, traditional insurance does nothing to you until you have a problem. So you crash your car or your house burns down, then they get involved. With cyber insurance, they've got a vested interest in making sure you don't have a claim. And it's actually cheaper to invest money in you up front to, to, to strengthen your defences, whether that be giving you a bit of consultant time or do an assessment or look, here's a tool that we've already paid for. You can use as we have this putting stuff in place with you, the more they can reduce your risk of a, of a claim, the more they save money. Because when the claim comes in, it's quite costly to them. So I think it's worth viewing, like have a look around for not just the prices you can get for your insurance for what you have, but also what you can get from them as an added value. And then if there is a claim, if you do have to contact them, what can you get from that event? How much would it cost you? How quickly could you get somebody in yourself? Um, if you've got to have a company on standby, how are you going to, you've got to pay for that anyway. If you want someone there ready and waiting, 
they're not going to get a free unit retainer on them. Is the price of your insurance going to be close to the price of that retainer for the amount of skills that you need? So I think I would weigh it against what it would cost you to do on your own. It's quite like the outsourcing the specialist I mentioned on other areas. Like they are ready and waiting to help you if you need it. And they'll make sure you don't have a problem as much as they can. Because the more they can save you on well, the, the less problems you have, the less problems they have. Thank you. James, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, on yeah j just, just to build on that, I, sp I suppose the other thing is it's the range of policies that are available now. So this is... So my suggestion is actually go out to market, as Craig was saying, and just understand what's actually on offer as well. There is a huge range uh, of services, um, you know, right the way through from, uh, you know, brand protection, if there was to be an outbreak, right the way through to getting uh, manpower on the floor to actually rebuild computers if they've been uh, attacked. I mean, my view is I, I think it's absolutely essential, especially for some of the large businesses that heavily depend on technology. Um, to have that support and, and ready to, to make that phone call if we need that support uh, as and when and if it happens. So, big advocate of it. Thank you. Andrew, have you got any thoughts on cyber insurance? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, it can be helpful. As Craig said, um, one of the key things there is there's a motivation to actually avoid paying out, especially as payouts can be absolutely massive if needed. Um, I think it's improving things in the industry. My concern is that at some point it's going to start being used more like we treat car insurance where you assume you're going to have an accident and get a payout at some point. Um, let's hope that doesn't happen though. <laughs> Thank you. So thinking from about perceptions, um, do you think that cybersecurity is still seen as a technology issue uh, to sit within the IT departments or is it a wider risk issue? Uh, and where do you guys think that the responsibility for cybersecurity should should sit within a business? Andrew, if I can start with you. Um, I think it lies with everybody to a certain extent. Um, what we frequently see when we work with companies is that it's, again, it's the middle ground that's bought into cybersecurity. So it's managers. They, they understand, especially in IT, that they've got to do security well. The problem is, is that it's the people... Uh, on the ground who maybe don't really understand that just leaking your email password or something like that can actually be an attacker's foothold onto your network. Um, especially things like gig working, uh, very short term contracts means you've got high turnover of staff. It can be hard getting people to buy in at that level. At the same time, management sometimes don't buy in as well. Um, so they, they don't invest the time and effort uh, into security that they need to. Um, I don't know how we fix that, though, to be honest. Unfortunately, it, we seem to be in a, uh, a kind of phase where people don't have any cybersecurity incidents for years. Something big happens. They invest in cybersecurity. Nothing happens. Therefore, they think the investment in cybersecurity isn't needed. Um, and it just cycles like that again and again. Yeah, absolutely. Craig, any thoughts? I think it's definitely a business problem. It's not an IT problem. IT is part of the solution, but the business has to accept it and own it itself. Um, I mean, the, for a long time, IT has been, it's, it's, it's a cost center. It's something you've got to pay for just to do work. Um, it's Sometimes that bleeds into, okay, you're now a business enabler. You can allow us to do new things. And for tech companies, it is the business itself. Um, but for a lot of businesses, IT is just a cost and it's a pain and things don't work. And no one ever complains about it. No, you ever hear about IT when it works fine. It's only when it's broken you hear about it. Um, cybersecurity affects the entire business and how it operates. We're not just a cost center anymore. We are fundamental to how businesses operate. And especially as technology use more and more to do more and more activities within a business. I covered about, I talked about how, yeah, when you lose your systems, how can you get product to customers? You can't get it there because you're so reliant on technology. It's definitely a business problem. It's not an IT problem and it has to be managed all the way through. Thank you. James, obviously your role at North is um, board level. Have you found that cybersecurity has managed to, to reach the boardroom level? Yes, uh, I mean, that's absolutely key. I, I think just to build on both Andrew and Craig's point, it is everybody's responsibility. It's not just IT, it's everybody within, within the business. Um, we have an information security committee and that's made up of uh, a number of people, actually of which the vast majority of people are not IT, which is great. So the, the business is absolutely bought into this. They understand the importance of it. Um, and it is discussed at both a uh, board level and also uh, across the wider business. 
uh, and it is really, really, really important and taken very seriously. Obviously, working in the in the risk insurance industry, uh, we understand the risks uh, involved uh, in that. So, yeah, absolutely Excellent. agree. So, again, to everyone, um, what can we do to get businesses to understand the threat better, to take more action, to take it more seriously? What do you think the next step should be? Uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to jump in on that. I, I think. I, I think the one thing we've got to be very careful of is not to use the scare tactics angle. Um, I think um, it, it might work sometimes, but using the scare tactics, if we don't do this, this is what could happen. I think whilst we need to educate people, um, they need to understand the threats. But I think we need to be very careful about how much we force people to, into a corner and, and talk about uh, the the, uh, the the scare the scary part of it. I think what we need to do is we need to uh, educate people, give them a better understanding of some of the risks, but also some of the opportunities and benefits that will come from uh, carrying out a better understanding of the threats that are out there. Andrew, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in agreement there. Um, you've got to always put risks in perspective. You know, I, I was talking about some serious things there with ships, but they, they aren't happening. There's no evidence these are happening today. But protecting against those, those issues happening doesn't tend to cost that much. You know, you can fix these vulnerabilities. It might not be someone, st you know, steering a ship remotely. It might just be someone working out how to get free Wi-Fi on your cruise ship and, you know, losing you thousands of dollars a month or something like that. So the, I think we need to keep risk in proportion. We need to be better at communicating. Um, IT and information security need to communicate things to people in words and understandable ways, really. I, I think... There's too many times when people just don't understand the risk. They think it's ridiculous. They don't realise that these things do sometimes happen. And I, I think that's key, really. Craig, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, to, I guess to touch on what's being said already, I think storytelling is a big part of it and using the right language that people understand is, is really important. And you can't put it into the context within a person, within which a person's working and operating. They can't relate to what you're trying to tell them. So I think communicating risks in a, in a realistic way is really important and using it in a way they can understand and relate to. Now, for some people, that will be very close to the terminology we use within cybersecurity. For others, it'll be trying to, to, to transition it from how we operate in cybersecurity to how we operate within logistics and then trying to bridge that gap. So if, if this happened to you in your whatever role they're doing and then making it apply to the way that they work and think. So I think storytelling and language is quite important on that. And again, as, as James said, VSL and just doesn't work because people lose interest. The, the press is constantly VSL and businesses are always VSL and the sky is always falling down. And it just doesn't work. People are tired of it. I think we're all just exhausted from the emotional, just the sky is always falling down on top of us. And people know that now and they don't care anymore because they keep getting that same message. I think we need to avoid that and make it relatable. And if we can demonstrate it in easy ways with low impact, like, Fishing tests, just send everyone a phishing email and when they click it, just say, oops, you've been fishing, show them what they missed. Literally on the screen, show them the email that they've just read and what they should have seen or a different email address. The wording's wrong, there's typos in here, it's got the wrong information. Just point out the things they've, they've just literally seen. This is where you went wrong. It's little tests like that where it can demonstrate where the problems are. Because as Andrew said, these issues are very complicated, they're very technical and it's very hard to communicate. So we've got to do it in a way that people can understand. Excellent, thank you. So stepping away from um, Marine for a minute um, into the, the, the biggest situation that's happening at the minute, what extra precautions um, should we be, be implementing due to the increased homework and due to the COVID-19 situation? Andrew, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I've seen some interesting situations in the last few months with neighbours who have been told to work from home. Um, one of them works for a, a, a very large company um, and they've just been given shared VPN credentials. Everybody who's been told to go and work from home has got the same VPN credentials, um, <clears throat> which is obviously a concern. I mean, the prob I, there's another neighbour who is working on a home laptop on the corporate network now. No endpoint security, no oversight of what's on that machine at all. And, and that kind of stuff really scares me. Um, the problem is, again, it's very difficult for users to understand exactly what the impact of putting their home laptop on a corporate network is but people still aren't uh, following the principle of least privilege enough um, it's really common for us to find that when you if you've got any access to a corporate network with windows logins that gives me access to 
I can query the domain controller and find out all the users, all the servers on that network. That tiny little foothold gives us a lot of information. And it just takes a little chink in that armor and then attackers in. So now we've got people everywhere with all these possibly compromised laptops that you've got no oversight of. Um, and I, it, it's challenging once you've, again, people were told to work from home. And what was important on those, those first few days was it worked. They had VPN access. They could log into their email. Um, and now I think people are realizing that what they did then is hard to unroll. Now you've got people quite often don't have multi-factor authentication. And with the, you know, Office 365 in such heavy use now, again, once we're onto that, I can create documents. I can read documents. I can quite often access repositories of information that I shouldn't have access to. So it's made those end users much more uh, vulnerable, but also important in maintaining security. Rick? Yeah, there's probably not too much more I can say than what, already, what Andrew's already covered. One thing I will say is that we've moved, I mean, logistics for us has always been a distributed environment. We've always had people effectively working from home, whether it's on the go on in, in transport vehicles or they're in hotels or they're in offices elsewhere. We've always been a remote working company. Um, the rest of the world is now becoming more like a logistics firm because people are distributed everywhere. They've left the office, they've left their, their home base, they're now all over the place. And if they haven't been used to working that way, they're seeing the problems that we've already had to deal with. Anything to add to that, James? Oh, well, yeah, a couple, a couple of things, I suppose. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of uh, our experience. Um, we already had business laptops out and we had VPN in place for two-factor authentication, which I think, you know, Andrew touched on earlier, really, really key. And we also, for our remote overseas offices, already had Citrix in place. So we were quite fortunate when we moved to a fully remote uh, operation, we had the technologies in, in place to be able to do that. Um, I think one of the other things, uh, again, Andrew, I think you touched on earlier, was around phishing emails and, and Craig about these phishing testing emails. So actually, we have seen a significant increase in phishing emails coming into our business. So we've done a lot of work in that around education. And exactly as we were talking about earlier, um, we've got some technology where we actually send out, I want to say, test phishing emails. And then if people click on them, it highlights the areas and the giveaway messages and then automatically enrolls them on a training course. A very quick video on highlighting some of the areas that need to, to look for because that, actually I think that is one of the uh, really emerging challenges that we all have as, a, as an IT department or technology department is around phishing emails because we can see it more and more every day, uh, both statistically uh, and, and in practice as, as well. Um, and I think training, 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 again, you know, people's awareness, but doing it at the right way, not sending out huge emails, but actually just a quick couple of pictures. Here's some giveaway signs on a phishing email. Here's this, here's that, are really, really powerful. And that's what we've been doing quite a lot of over the last uh, few months. So that's similar to what we've been doing on the port, um, sh short bursts of information rather than long voluminous texts. So Andrew, I just want to pick up, pick up on something that, that you mentioned there. Um, obviously, for, with the working from home, um, a huge amount of companies have had to mobilize large numbers of staff very quickly with, um, yeah. <clears throat> with as much um, due diligence as they normally would do. Is there any simple steps that companies can take to protect themselves? And then I'll, I'll open it out to, to, to everyone just on on how we should take things forward. But I'm quite interested on the companies who have quickly mobilized, they've got them working, and now they're taking the time to reflect on what they've done uh, to make sure it's secure. But as you said, the priority was making sure people could still work. Now we're having to reflect yeah. on what we've done and make sure that it's secure. Yeah, I think um, probably the, the most important step that can be done at, at low cost is multi-factor authentication. Um, so nearly, nearly, even if you don't have corporate mobiles, nearly everybody has a mobile device and an authenticator running on a personal mobile device, although that's not as good as it being on something managed by MDM or something like that, it's still better having your laptop and a mobile device <coughs> that second factor. It means if your users do get fished, that attacker has to be a lot more determined to be able to get that phishing code, uh, the, the multi-factor code and use that. I think that's probably one of the biggest steps. The other thing is, is just, just to perform an audit of your domain to understand who in your domain has more rights than they should do. If people are working from home, they probably shouldn't have admin rights on any of your servers, for example. Um, <clears throat> it's, but the problem is there's not really any good tools to do that um, that I know of. I, I've always found that a very challenging aspect of auditing the security of a company. 
Okay, thank you very much. So, magic wand question to all of you. Um, what do you see as the single biggest cyber risk to businesses? And what would be the one thing that each of you would recommend uh, to enable businesses to tackle it? James, do you want to go take that one? Yeah, sure. I, I, have to get, I, I think I've already touched on it. I, I believe that phishing emails is one of, our, one of the biggest risks that we have at the moment. Um, and I think, we, again, we even touched on it earlier about training, educating people. Um, you know, as a business, carry out risk assessment. Try to understand what you believe the risks are. There were some great slides earlier sharing um, where those threats might come from, how they might mitigate, uh, how they might materialize. So actually, some, some great information in today's sessions just for you to start thinking about how you might want to try and step forward. And, you know, bring in a partner. Uh, we... we we don't have all the security skills in-house. We use a third party to help support us, which I'm sure a number of other uh, companies do as well. Um, Utilise some third parties to help give you some support and advice. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, for me, I'd say ransomware is the thing that keeps me awake at night. That really worries me, and the impact of it is so enormous. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's all three of the CIA that we've talked about today. Um, availability is probably the biggest one because we could stop your business from trading if it's as widespread as it could be. And with the way that criminals are acting today, where they'll, they'll wait for a while before they do anything, they'll have a look around, um, they'll exfiltrate data, they'll try and steal money from your bank accounts, they'll cause confusion, and then they'll, they'll turn the switch and everything gets locked up. And that's when you get your ransom demand. And it's 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 become more of a like a the framework that they're using rather than the thing that happens, they get in there and they then they escalate, they move sideways with your network and they try and compromise as much as they can. And they might take months before they do anything. And if they go after your backups, what are you going to do? You, your only choice is to pay the ransom, in which case you've got to try and negotiate the best price you can and get that key and decrypt your stuff. Otherwise your, your data is all gone. And there's so many ways for that to get in. Like is one of the easiest because it's so straight, it's so straightforward to fall for and everyone does it. Everyone can be fished, is my opinion, including me. Like, I'm definitely susceptible to it. We all are. But there's every other way I've talked about today, they can all deliver ransomware to you. So that's what worries me the most. Yeah, Craig, I think just to pick up on your point about this ransomware, it could be sat dormant, just spreading itself within your network for months, yeah. infecting the backups and everything else. That's, yeah, that's the, the worrying challenge that we all have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Andrew, any thoughts on? Um, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, ransomware and, and kind of unconstrained spread of malware within the network is the one that I think is the, is the big issue. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly hard to detect now. Not all ransomware is naive. You know, as Craig says, people want to gain access to those high value assets first. And if they can damage your backups so they're not there, then you've, you've got big problems. Um, and phishing is probably the biggest attack vector that gets people nowadays. That's nearly always the initial foothold that people get on the network. It's not vulnerabilities. It's not your attack surface. It, it's someone phishing, a bog standard user, someone who doesn't even have significant rights on the network. It's this combination of tar well, targeted or skilled attackers, active attackers with that, that what previously was just automated ransomware that might only have hit 30 of your machines. Now it'll hit hundreds of them. Okay, brilliant times. Thank you very much to everyone. It's been fascinating to speak to you all and uh, listen to your insights. Um, I'll pass back over to Phil to wrap up. I know we're getting near time. Phil, back over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, fascinating and excellent discussion. Hopefully you can hear me. I've had to put my earphones on because I've lost sound on my phone, but there you go. Such is technology. My tuppence worth, though, for, uh, for that last discussion was I think it's the biggest risk is still around people convenience, speed, laziness, lack of understanding. These are all constant issues. And I think they're the games that uh, cyber criminals play against. That's what they, if they can catch people when they're unaware, it's Friday afternoon, you know, when they're just up against deadlines, that's a, a real issue. So I'd ask um, really those who uh, lead businesses to set an example when it comes to security. People will be looking to you for guidance. And as the saying goes, a fish rots from the head downwards. So if you've got a role to play, you play that role and don't expect other people to do things that you will do. So I can just say what fascinating presentations, guys. Thank you very much. I'm both excited and terrified now. Logistics is one of my passions, but uh, eating a sandwich or going on a cruise ship is never going to be the same for me again. <laughs> <laughs> so cyber security has a technical aspect. There's no doubt about that. But what's clear from the events like this one is how much of a business risk this really is. Not that I sleep well at this time of year, especially at this time of year. 
But if anything is going to keep business leaders awake at night, really this should be it. Well, that's it for our third Cyberfest event. There are seven more throughout the month. The next one is uh, next Tuesday with an early afternoon session on cybersecurity in healthcare. Another hot button issue, as they say. I hope to see you there. I'd like to thank all the speakers, Craig Hayes, Andrew Tierney, James Holmes, and Ian Blake. I'd also like to thank Dr. Joe North and the Port of Time for their support, as well as Dynamo Northeast, Accenture, and the Innovation Super Network. Also a huge thanks to Claire from Beacon House Events for handling all the tech behind the scenes. And of course, thank you all for attending. Look out for it uh, I've been on YouTube very shortly. And remember, September is Cyberfest. See you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.